And just a couple of points. I, I think your question is a good question. It's a question that's posed at almost every symposium or conference of this nature. Is, is there not some situation in which torture, because we're talking about torture or even something less than torture, could be justified? And I agree with Philippe. I don't think that the law can ever justify that. There may be a, a point at which the president or someone responsible will make the decision, I'm going to engage in coercive techniques, and then I'll defend myself for the use of those techniques. Military lawyers are very, very familiar with the concept of extent and mitigation. But the problem that we've always had in, in the military with, with that red herring that isn't there always an exception is that we weren't <clears throat> excuse me we weren't dealing with with coercive techniques as a matter of exception what we were dealing with was an administration that was using coercive techniques as the norm not the set, not an exception and setting up a system that relied on coercive techniques and there's a world of difference between that and a very unusual situation where a commander in chief may may have to make a decision which he would have to defend but still couldn't uh, be legitimized by law. And I have to, the second point, I have to align myself with Philippe. I, I disagree with, with Mary Ellen. I think one of the main points of the British White Paper that she made reference to uh, in terms of uh, drawing that line of connectivity between Al Qaeda and the Taliban government of, of uh, Afghanistan was the fact that the United States did request the turnover of those responsible. And Al-Qaeda and Taliban government, and I think this is never going to happen again because I think countries will learn from this, simply said, come hit us. Not only are we not going to turn these people over, but hey, we're complicit. We completely agree with what they did. That's, that's a pretty good line of connectivity in terms of demonstrating state responsibility. So those are the two, two responses that I would make. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, the, this last discussion ended with uh, how the international community and international law has, has sort of developed over the years and I think over the course of the 20th century it really looks like international law was very reactive if you look at the developments from post-World War I, post-World War II, uh, throughout the Cold War, uh, throughout what happened after the Cold War with uh, ICTY. Uh, uh, the Rwanda issues. Um, moving from that to how this administration and, and Dean Romig's question, how this administration should address it from here on out, uh, it, it's been widely discussed and it's, and it's understood at this point that some rollbacks need to be made, some changes need to be made uh, to regain our place in the world as it was pre-9-11 and, and, and how the world viewed us. Um, my question then is, uh, it, it's two parts. One, what can this administration also do uh, to address the problems uh, that were, that made the United States a target on September 10th uh, in, in a perfect world where they've made all the changes that, that have rolled back the issues from uh, post-September 11th? And how can the international community and how can international law be changed to, uh, this almost sounds uh, tongue in cheek, but honestly, to protect the United States from non-state actors that make, us, that make the United States a target because of its unique position in the world, whether or not it's an empire anymore, whether or not we're in the throes of the, uh, the, the passing throes of an empire, uh, if, if that is the case, then uh, the international community has always strived to protect nations from other nations. What can the international community do and what can this administration do to address those very large, broad issues that... No, I'll, I'll make a stab. I, no, I appreciate the question. Um, First, I think we have to dismiss the myth. I mean, Amos Guerra spoke to this. Um, I don't take quite as extreme, as extreme abuse he does, but there's no such thing as perfect security. We will never be perfectly safe. Um, we need a healthy military. We need our police forces. We need to be vigilant. We need very good um, FBI language skills. Um, we need a, a healthy intelligence gathering. 
we need all those things. We're, we're never going to get back to the Garden of Eden. There's, there's no hope of that, and we have to uh, recognize that and, and, and do what we can within the rule of law, because what we have learned over time is that um, the, the closest you stay to the rule of law, to what you consider to be the rule of law, the, the more you set that demonstration effect that this is the way to live and this is what has had positive effects. Violence, I mean, we, we've actually, through law, eliminated some of the most egregious forms of military force. We have empirically confirmed success of, of the impact and the power of norms. And I'll just point out the most dramatic example. After the Second World War, when the use of force as an instrument of foreign policy was finally um, made unlawful in the United Nations Charter with an institution to back it up, we ended conquest as a form of military force. It became unlawful and it was never used. There was never the elimination of a member of the United Nations through the use of military force. Iraq tried and invaded Kuwait. A coalition of states came together, almost every state in the world, pushed Iraq back according to the United Nations Charter, liberated Kuwait, the United States made money out of the deal because we had such strong normative and resource support for that. It was, it was um, such a positive reinforcement of a very important and successful rule. That's the model that I'd like to take forward. I'd like to continue to support on, uh, building the norm of nonviolence, spreading it out beyond just interstate war and conquest to where it sh really should be going. For example, the, the greatest use of force and the greatest loss of life is within countries in civil wars. And the United States so caught up in using military and violent, uh, significant violent responses to what happened on 9-11, we haven't been there to try to respond to what's been going on internally in countries in Congo where millions, over a million people have died. Um, and, and, and to continue to say that we have to have nonviolent responses within countries is for me the way to go forward. When you build successful countries that have prosperity and education, the will to violence and, and, and people have jobs, the, the desperation and so forth that leads into these alternatives begin to end. And this may seem like pie in the sky, but remember we've done it. We have been able to eliminate some forms of major military force through norms and that's the way I'd like to go and that's why I'm so restrictive on the use of force even in self-defense and uh, why I think the Afghanistan example should be dealt with very cautiously while I think the case can be made I think it's slim and I think the United States would have done better if we had erred on the side of robust uh, law enforcement methods in responding to Afghanistan the uh, Lawrence Wright's excellent book the looming tower talks about how the Taliban had become fed up with Al Qaeda. They wanted them out. They had been using, they had been misusing the hospitality of the Taliban and launching violent attacks in violation of Islam. The negotiations to get rid of them were proceeding, and after the outrages of 9/11, may have gone better. We don't know that. There was some case, and I don't say it was. There was no case for self-defense under Article 51, but. I hope the lessons that we're learning from this current violent period in which the United States has used too much military force in these situations and wholly unlawful military force in Iraq will be a new era in which we move toward renewing our commitment not only to the rule of law in general but to the non-use of force and to the peaceful settlement of disputes and alternatives to these incredibly grave problems. That's how I think we'll build our security of the future.